OK, so we're going to look at the cap M. Let's just go through all the bits and pieces that underpin it. You see, first of all, let's just start with a basic idea, even something that I can cope with. You know, risk and return. And understand that there are some basic ideas or assumptions that underpin all. For example, we're assuming that investors are both rational and risk averse. So what does a rational investor do? Well, the very simple deal is this. If we have two investments with similar risk, what would you do? Would you go for the investment with the higher or lower return? Well, most definitely. Given similar risk, you would always opt for the higher return. That's the risk. That's the rational expectation. If we look at risk aversity, well, we know that all investors are risk averse. They don't like risk. But when we're looking at risk aversity here, we're simply saying, if we have two investments with similar return, what would you go for? The one with the higher or lower risk? Again, lower risk is what we would go for. Based on those two decision criteria, we should be able to get somewhere with regard to deciding between one investment and another. To illustrate this, what I have is a very simple example. If we look at example seven, what have we got? Well, how would Mr. Voronin rank the following investments? So we've got expected return here, no problem. Um, and then we've got risk. Now, don't worry too much about talking about percentage risk here. All I'm trying to focus on is the idea that some are more risky and others are less risky. And this is the easiest way of illustrating it. So if we were able to plot these, well, let's just see how it pans out. We know that we have what? 10% risk, 10% return. That's A. Then we have 20% risk, 10% return. B. We have 20%, 20%. C, and we have 20% return, 25% risk, D. Now, if we were to look at these, um, are there any investments we definitely would not do? Well, I think we could say quite quickly that looking at A and B, we really don't want B, do we? Because B has the same return as A, but a higher degree of risk. So we know that B would be a no-no. Also, we could say that looking at C and B, they have the same degree of risk, but C offers a higher degree of return. So from that perspective, we could say B is not wanted. C is better than B, and so is A. Likewise, if we look at C and D, they have the same degree of return, but D has greater risk. Using the risk-averse criteria, we would always prefer C to D, therefore let's get rid of D. So we're suggesting that just by using these basic criteria, the rational criteria, the risk-averse criteria, we are able to make some sort of choice. But what we now want to do is to come up with some way of deciding between investment A and C. Of course, what we're seeing is simply this. A may be preferred because it's lower risk, whereas C may be preferred because it generates a higher return. And to a certain extent, it's the degree of risk and return that the individual shareholder has that determines whether A is better or C is better. So maybe the best way of looking at it is this. Where on this graph do you want to operate? Where's the best place to be? Well, if you think about it, the best place to be is where we have the highest possible return and the lowest possible risk. We want to be somewhere up here, don't we? Now, 
What we could do, just as an illustration, is to steal a an idea from economics. You see, in economics, there is this concept called indifference curves. And all indifference curves show is points of equal acceptability to the investor in this case. You see, if I were to sketch up indifference curves, given that the best value is somewhere in the top left-hand corner, what we may find is that the indifference curves for an individual investor look something like that. Remember, each curve illustrates points of equal acceptability, or if you want to use the economics term, utility. And what we would find is that this curve up here, of course, is better than the next curve because it's, it's closer to the point that we really want to be. If, after sketching these sort of curves, we then look at investments A and C, based on this investor, what would we say? What would they rather have? Would they rather have investment A or investment C? Well, it looks like this indifference curve here passes through investment A, but is somewhere to the left and above investment C. As such, with this individual investor, remember each one has a different approach to risk, we would say that they prefer A to C. If, however, we were to look at an alternative investor who maybe had indifference curves like this, couldn't we say in this circumstance that if we look at this indifference curve, A falls below it and C falls above it? From that perspective, this investor would prefer C to A. And you could argue that this investor has less consideration of risk in so much as that they are willing to accept quite a considerable increase in risk for a relatively small increase in return. So, all I've tried to do so far is to get some basic ideas out about the relationship of risk to return. And realistically, the only thing that I want you to remember is that's where we want to be, the top left-hand corner. So, given that we've got that risk out of the way, what we could do is maybe focus on portfolio theory. Okay, when we look at portfolio theory, the idea goes something like this. Instead of investing in one investment, couldn't we invest in more than one? You see, I've got investment A here. And what I see is that it's very cyclical. I've got peaks and troughs of the business, yes? Now, these peaks and troughs represent the degree of volatility and hence risk of this investment because the return can be as high as this value here and as low as that value. If we just held this single investment we would have to accept that degree of volatility and risk. What would happen, however, if we looked at a second investment, imaginatively called investment B? What we see is, again, we have peaks and troughs of business, an enormous amount of volatility. And again, we have a substantial difference between the maximum and the minima. But if we start to look at it a little bit more closely, and of course this is a very artificial example, can't we see that the peaks and the troughs are inversely related? What I've found, very luckily, are two investments where when one peaks, the other one is in a trough and vice versa. And what would happen if I invested half of my money in A and half of my money in B? Well, 
If I did that, wouldn't we get some degree of cancelling out? If I did that, instead of having the enormous peaks and troughs we had before, we'd have peaks and troughs that are far lower. The degree of volatility is far lower, and if there's less volatility, you know, the range between the top and the bottom, we have less risk. So this is rather fantastic. All we're suggesting is by holding a mix of investments that are inversely related. We can eliminate risk, but remember, the underlying return is not affected. The return will just be the average of the two. So that's our starting point. And what we're basically suggesting is this idea. If we were to give these indices, maybe we could always say from a UK perspective, investment A is in an umbrella manufacturer. And investment B is an ice cream manufacturer. And the suggestion goes something like this. If the sun comes out, the ice cream manufacturer does well. If the sun goes in and it starts raining, the umbrella manufacturer does well. Therefore, we win all the time. OK? Um, or at least we cancel out the peaks with the troughs. But I think we can all accept that, although mathematically this is going to work, it's really quite difficult to get this sort of inverse relationship. Here, the inverse relationship is with regard to the weather, or rainfall, if you wish. But can you get it for all the economic factors of the marketplace? Well, the answer is no. It's very difficult to get inversely related investments. But this is where it becomes a bit clever. We are suggesting here that inversely related investments eliminate the risk. Do you remember that? But the clever bit is that if we just look at picking investments at random, provided they are not positively related, you know, have direct positive correlation, where as one rises, the other one rises, as one falls, the other one falls. Provided they are not directly related in that manner, we still get the benefits of the portfolio. They don't have to be inversely related, they simply don't have to be perfectly, positively correlated. Wow. So this makes life a lot easier. Instead of hunting out umbrellas and ice cream or something like this, all we have to do is to add investment after an investment. And because their peaks and troughs are not all the same, the more investments that we add, the lower the overall risk that we suffer. What a wonderful idea. To illustrate this fact, I've just got a couple of investments, just as a discussion point. You see, if we were looking at perfect negative correlation, the suggestion is that we could earn a return with no risk. Something like this. If we hold a mix of half of A and half of B, and they are perfectly negatively correlated, you know, one goes up because the other one goes down, we will eliminate the risk. We would get to a point on the y-axis. That's fine. Very difficult to achieve, but theoretically, that is what we could get. What would happen if we had perfectly, positively correlated investments? You know, as one rises, the other one rises. As one falls, the other falls. 
Well, in that circumstance, we get no reduction of risk. All we would see is that we would get an average of risk, just as we have an average of return. So this shows perfect positive correlation. And this shows perfect negative correlation. Now that's all well and good. But the issue is that it's very difficult to get either perfect positive or perfect negative correlation. And therefore, what would happen if we just pick a couple of investments at random? Well, in that circumstance, we don't get either of those perfect ones, but we will get some reduction, some reduction in the risk. And that is what I'm interested in. Let's get rid of the perfection which doesn't exist and simply suggest that, ho, oh, if we've got two investments randomly selected, we would expect some of the risk to be eliminated. And hence, that must put us in a better position because presumably, if we are at this point here, we are closer to the y-axis, but we are no closer to the x-axis. That means we have a reduction in risk but with no reduction in return. The return is just the average of both investments. Well, okay, that's all well and good in its own right. What about this idea? If I added investment C, maybe up there, mix of A and C would maybe give us that relationship, a mix of A and B would maybe give us that relationship. But if we added A and B and C together, maybe it pushes the line even further to the left. And if we added investment D, investment D would have a relationship with A and B and C. But if we added it, the overall portfolio maybe again will be reduced a little bit further. And that's the whole idea behind portfolio theory. As we add more and more investments, what we expect to see is this. By adding more and more investments, we expect to see the risk reduce further and further. Now, my question is this. Given that the risk reduces, do we expect it to fall to zero? Well, the answer is no, because as we will see in a moment, some risk can never be eliminated. But this is rather powerful because what we're suggesting is simply this. As a result of just adding investments, holding a mix of investments, we can reduce our risk with no reduction in return. And as such, the holding of a portfolio should be a rational approach for the investor. So, we've established the idea that there is a means of reducing the risk. And what I want to do now is to talk about the risks involved. You see, we can now separate the risks into a systematic risk portion and an unsystematic risk portion. Now, when we look at systematic risk, what we're suggesting is this. This is economy-wide risk. The suggestion is that this risk relates to the economy itself, and there is nothing that we can do about it. Your examiner talks about it as being the risk associated with the financial system. Given the events of 2008, I think we all know that there is something called a credit crunch. 
And I'm guessing that the credit crunch is affecting all businesses to some degree or other. So that's a fantastic example, although not a very palatable example to a lot of people. Unsystematic risk is company-specific risk. This is the individual risk suffered by one company, but not another. You could say that a company suffers the risk of competition, or the marketplace, or something of this nature. But remember, a risk to one company is a reward to another. So overall, you could say, if you hold in shares in all of the companies, you don't suffer any of the company's specific risk, because there is always a winner for a loser. So from that perspective, when we look at systematic and unsystematic risk, um, systematic risk cannot be diversified away. What I mean by that is that we must suffer systematic risk, regardless of whether we hold a portfolio or not. Whereas, if we look at unsystematic risk, it can be diversified away. All we have to do is to hold a portfolio of shares. If we hold a portfolio, a mix of shares, we can eliminate this risk. Well. Wow. If we can win, eliminate it, there's a very important point here. Will we be rewarded for suffering unsystematic risk? Will anybody offer us a return for suffering it? Well, the answer must be no. If we could avoid it by the simple expedient of holding a number of shares, why would we be compensated for suffering unsystematic risk? If you were less than charitable, you could say that we are only suffering this risk because we are stupid. Therefore, very importantly here, it's not compensated for by return. However, when we look at our systematic risk, we cannot avoid it. We cannot avoid it at least by holding a portfolio. Therefore, if we suffer systematic risk, we expect to be compensated for it. So this is compensated for by return. Now, Please note that when we talk about anything to do with the CAPM, this is the risk that is incorporated within the CAPM. Okay? This is the bit that we want. Right. So, we've looked a little bit at the different types of risk, and we have to be very careful to be able to describe these types of risks to the examiner. Um, Whilst we're here, what we could do is just give some understanding as to how holding a portfolio will reduce the risk. I gave you my Mickey Mouse diagram before, but maybe what we could do is just look at it in this manner. If we were to plot the number of shares, the number of different shares held within our portfolio, and we plotted the degree of risk, what we get is this sort of relationship. Now, remember we said that the systematic risk cannot be diversified away. We must suffer the systematic risk. But, 
By holding a number of shares within our portfolio, we can eliminate the unsystematic portion. And it's quite startling how quickly we start eliminating it. By holding a mix of only 20 shares, we should eliminate nearly 90% of the risk. 25 to 30, 95 plus percent of the risk. And as such, even a small investor by ju judicious investment should be able to eliminate a lot of the risk. Remember, when I say holding 20 or 25 or 30 shares, I'm saying randomly selected shares. And of course, we could actively attempt to reduce the risk by maybe being more systematic in our way of choosing the shares. Yes, by maybe looking for different industry sectors. Yes, or maybe even different markets. So very quickly, we can eliminate the risk. And realistically, if we get to 25 or 30 shares, we can effectively say that the vast majority of the unsystematic risk can be eliminated. Well, OK, if that's the case, we're going to say that the CAPM model only focuses on the systematic portion of risk. And that becomes incredibly important later on. What we now want to do is to just look at how the model works. And to do that, what I would like to do is to sketch up something called the securities market line. I'd be surprised if you would be required to draw this yourself. It's very rare that examiners want any form of diagram drawn. And remember, by drawing it, you really do hoist yourself by your own petard in so much as you draw it, then you have to label it, and then you have to comment on it. But what we could do here is we could plot our risk. Plot our risk in relation to return. Now, if we're looking at the security market line, all I'm doing is cutting to the chase. We're getting straight to what CAPM is all about. You see, there are two basic points that we can identify or plot. One point is where we generate a return without any risk. If you remember, we talked about this as our risk-free return. The assumption is that we can generate a risk-free return if we invest in government short-dated bonds, classically called treasury bills. Secondly, we assume that we can hold the market portfolio. That is, a mix of all shares within the stock exchange in proportion to their relative holdings. If we can hold that, there will be a mix of risk and return relating to that portfolio. That generates a value, Rm, the return relating to the market portfolio. Of course, we can hold any mix of government bonds and the market portfolio. As such, we can draw our security market line. You see, we know that if we're here, we're holding all of our investment in the market portfolio. No problem. If we're here, we're holding all of our investment in government bonds. No risk. And we get a risk-free return. We could be here if half of our investment was in government bonds and half in the market portfolio. So, we can operate at any point on the securities market line. We could, in fact, operate at somewhere above this point. Now, the final thing that we must highlight about this is how we measure risk. We measure risk in terms of a value called beta. And we give the market portfolio's degree of risk a beta of 1. 
Remember what we said when we started talking about the CAPN. We said that we wanted to measure the return offered by an individual investment in relation to the market. If the investment has a lower degree of risk, it should offer a lower return. If it has a higher degree of risk, it should offer a higher return. And that is the basis of everything that we look at here. Now, let's just look at this beta for a moment. And let's just first of all play around with the sort of industries maybe that would have a higher or lower beta. And then we could discuss what it actually means. So if we're looking at beta, if we have a beta that is less than one, or a beta that is greater than one, less than one suggests that the systematic risk to the industry is lower than the overall market. Greater than one would suggest that the systematic risk suffered by the industry is higher than the market. Remember what we said, systematic risk was all about the overall market. You know, economic forces or the underlying financial system. So what sort of industries are less affected by maybe an economic downturn? Well, I suppose what we could talk about are things like food retailing. Yes, people may buy cheaper joints of meat. People, people may decide to save a little bit on what they spend. But the fact is that everybody has to eat. From that perspective, food retaining will probably be affected that much less. What else would be uh, affected less? Well, maybe we could look at things like the utilities, on the basis that people will still heat their houses, on the basis that people will still use water and electricity. So these are the sort of things, if you wish, the necessities of life that are less affected. You could also suggest education and training. Maybe there's a perverse effect that when people find that maybe their jobs are more at risk, they're more interested in getting qualifications to help them for the future. What sort of beaters would we expect greater than one? Well, if we looked at the industries, maybe we could look at anything to do with construction. The construction industry, building what? Houses, building infrastructure, building tower blocks. These tend to all occur during the peak times of economic activity. What else? Well, maybe we could talk about luxury goods. On the basis that if you haven't got the money, you will not spend it on luxury goods or any large value goods. Maybe the purchase of a car could be deferred. The need for a washing machine is slightly less great, that sort of thing. And possibly you could argue travel, both business and tourist tra travel will both be adversely affected. So these are just suggestions. Now, what do I mean by a beta? Well, let's just look at it this way. If the beta equals 0.5, what we're suggesting is this. If, say, the market is expected to fall by 10%, we will be looking at the individual company falling by half of that 10%. If we had a beta equal to 2, if the market fell by 20%, we would expect a company to fall by 2 times 10%, 20%. When I say fall by, I suppose what we're looking at at all times here is some sort of share price deal. Now, luckily, we do not have to worry about the calculation of the beta. Because if we did, we would have to do a lot more work than we presently are doing. 
Instead, all we need to do is to use the information given to us. And that leads us with just a single thing that we need to know. When we're looking at the cap M, the cap M formula is simply like this. Ke equals Rf plus beta Rm minus Rf. Now, we know what Rf is. Rf is the risk-free rate of return. Rm. Well, this is the return on the market portfolio. We know what beta is, we've discussed that already. Just one final point. Your examiner gets terribly excited, not so much about the return on the market portfolio, but the risk premium, which of course is the difference between the return on the market portfolio and the risk-free rate of return. Often it's described as the equity risk premium because invariably we are valuing a share and he may even discuss it as an ERP, if he so wishes. So, if we've got those, let's see how they work. Shouldn't be too difficult. So we have a Mickey Mouse example here. Coit Limited, the market return is 15%. Coit has a beta of 1.2, and the risk-free return is 8%. What is the cost of capital? Well, we know that KE equals RF plus beta... Rm minus Rf. Oh, let me point out that this formula is given in your formula sheet, but your examiner has got slightly more excited than I have with regard to the terminology. I want to keep it simple with things like Rf and Rm. Oh yes, and Ke. Whereas your examiner talks about the equity return for the investment and things like that, Er to the I. I like this formula. If you like the examiner's formula, learn that, because of course it is given in the exam. RF, 8%, plus beta, 1.2. RM, 15%, minus RF, 8%. Shouldn't be too difficult. What have we got there? 8.4 plus 8, 16.4%. When it comes to calculating the CAPM, everything is always very easy. But please remember those articles. Your examiner has written a whole article on CAPM, a whole article on the application of CAPM for project specific discount rates, and a whole article on advantages and disadvantages. And these articles will come up again and again and again. So you've got to be ready for them. Okay. Let's look at another question, just for fun. Crouch. The risk-free rate of return is 8%. The market risk premium is 6%, and the beta factor for Crouch is 0.8. So what do we say? Ke equals Rf plus beta Rm minus Rf. Rf. 8%. Plus beta. 0.8 multiplied by. Well, okay, I didn't allude to it. I hope you've picked up. We are given the risk premium. Remember, the risk premium is the net of Rm minus Rf. Therefore, we just multiply by the 6%. Is everyone quite happy with that? Good stuff. So we end up with something like 12.8%. And I'm not kidding, that is as easy as it gets. We can do this sort of thing. Now, I need you to look at the articles to look at advantages and disadvantages. I could talk about them myself, but it's much, much easier for you to focus on what the examiner wants you to focus on. If he tells you specific advantages and disadvantages, it's much more important that you tell them back to him in his words. Remember, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But there are a couple of simple observations we could make before we leave this point. 
Implications of the CAPM. Well, firstly, if an investor wants to avoid risk altogether, he must invest in a portfolio that consists entirely of risk-free securities, such as government debt. Yes, if we want to avoid risk altogether, that's all we can do. Invest in those treasury bills. Two, if the investor only holds an undiversified portfolio, he will suffer both unsystematic risk and systematic risk. Remember, to be uncharitable, they're being stupid because you can easily not suffer the unsystematic portion. If an investor holds a balanced portfolio of all the stocks and shares on the stock market, he will suffer systematic risk, which is the same as the average systematic risk in the market. Oh, I suppose you hold a market portfolio and you get the market risk and return. And of course, that underpins everything we say. And four, individual shares will have systematic risk characteristics, which are different to the market average. Their risk will be determined by the industry sector and, interestingly, gearing. Yeah, we must look at gearing in a moment, you know, the level of debt financing. Some shares will be more and some shares will be less risky. Well, I think we've already considered that. So, some very straightforward observations here, but just as a reinforcement as to what we've said. Right, let's now move on and look at something called the cost of debt. Remember, we've looked at the cost of equity, the rate of return required by the shareholder. Now, we won't want to do precisely the same sort of nonsense for the debt holder. Okay, now we want to consider the cost of debt. Um, looking at the cost of debt, please note, it's just the rate of return for the debt holders. And of course, because the debt holders are less risky than the shareholders, we would expect them to get a lower return. Let's look at some basic features about debt holders before we go any further. We could have low notes, or bonds or debentures. You know, all types of debt issued by a company. I must say, as I've stated already, I expect the term loan notes always to, use, to be used now. I use the term bonds and debentures solely to remind you of maybe what you've seen before. We could also talk about gilts and treasury bills, debt relating to governments, although it would be unlikely for us to be at all interested in calculating those. Traded debt is always quoted in $100 nominal units or blocks. This is just to make it easier for us to understand what the market value is. And as such, when we talk about the nominal value or par value, we're talking about $100 or, if the examples we're using are in pounds, £100. Interest paid is stated as a percentage of nominal value. Ah! The value of the debt may rise above or fall below 100. But when we talk about charging interest, the interest is only charged on the $100 block or nominal value. Debt can be irredeemable, never pay back, redeemable at par, or redeemable at a premium or a discount. We'll look at that in a moment. There is one other thing before we leave this area. If we're looking at interest, we would expect it to be net of tax. Remember, the whole point is this. As a debt holder, you are not a part owner of the business. Instead, the interest relates to an arm's length transaction between the debt holder and the company. As such, interest is paid pre-tax, before tax. And because of that, interest is effectively benefiting from a tax shield. Because for every one pound, let's say, of interest, some of that interest will effectively be paid by the taxman on the basis that taxable profits will fall. So, 
We tend to always see that when we look at cost of debt, it will be net of tax. And we'll see how to deal with that as we go on. Let's start by looking at irredeemable debt. This is debt that is not ever expected to be redeemed. Now, do you see irredeemable debt in most companies? Well, the answer is no. In fact, the only reason why we're learning about irredeemable debt is because there is a possible trick that we will come back to later. But it's not difficult for us to understand how it works. We have a formula. KD equals I 1 minus T over PO. If we were to look at this formula, I think we could say it's very similar to the sort of formula that we started off with with regard to cost of equity in the dividend valuation model. For example, didn't we say that KE equals D over PO? The only difference, of course, is this. When we're looking at the return associated with equity, it is in the form of dividend whereas the return in the form of debt is in the form of interest. The other thing, of course, we have to remember is this tax shield. You know the idea, 1 minus t. Therefore, if we have our interest, we have to multiply by 1 minus t to reflect the fact that some of the interest is paid by the taxman because the taxable profit is reduced. Well, OK, very simple stuff indeed, this. Let's just have a look at the example. Example 12. RAFA. The 10% irredeemable loan notes of RAFA PLC are quoted at a £120 X int. Ah, not surprisingly, if we're going to calculate our cost of equity X div after the dividend's been paid, when it comes to debt, we calculate it X int after the interest has been paid. I will say I've never seen a question that makes a big thing of this, but I thought I would just highlight that briefly. Corporation tax is payable at 30%. So let's go for it. KD equals I. Well, if we're looking at the interest, the interest relates to the nominal value. We're told that the interest rate is 10%. 10% of 100 comes to 10 pounds. But hold on a moment. We want it net of tax. So we multiply by 1 minus t, 1 minus 0.3. And that gives us our cost of debt. We divide through by 120, that being the price today, the market value. And that gives us our cost of debt. And, of course, if we put those numbers together, we get something like 5.83%, give or take. Now, as I've said to you, I don't think irredeemable debt will come up. Oh, I suppose if the examiner runs out of marks, he'll have to ask it. But that's not what we would normally expect. It is very rare to see irredeemable debt. In fact, I know only of one example that I can point to, and that example relates to government debt, which is something fundamentally different. So let's look at what is more likely to be the main event. Let's now look at redeemable debt. Now, the feature with redeemable debt is this. Life becomes slightly more complicated because, of course, we're going to have three distinct cash flows. On the one hand, we have the current market value. That's the market value today. Secondly, we have the interest payments year on year. And thirdly, because it's going to be redeemed, we will have a redemption value at some point in the future. So what we want to do is we want to establish what the return is with regard to these three cash flows. And the only way we can do it 
is by going back to what we've talked about before and getting the IRR, the internal rate of return. If we know the IRR, well, the IRR is the cost of debt. Now, I don't think this is difficult, but what I do think is awkward is the fact that we have very limited time to do this. It's a three or four mark allocation. And from that perspective, we cannot waste time doing it. Instead, what we should be doing is just ploughing through without thinking at all. Therefore, what I want to look at are some steps. Step one. All you have to do in step one is to prepare a seven column analysis. You'll see why in a moment. Step two, we want the cash flows. The cash flows dry everything, therefore we want the cash flows and of course related to the cash flows, the years. Step three, well step three we could get all fancy but this is where I'm not bothering. I'm guessing that the rate of return will be somewhere around five, six, seven percent. And from that perspective, all I want to do is this. I want to discount at 5% and 10%. Because I have not got time to go back and think what's going on. So I'm going to discount at these two values and interpolate whatever rubbish I get from this. Once I've discounted at 5 and 10%, then I slap it into the IRR interpolation formula. Now, this will not give us the most beautiful result. But at the same stage, the result will be absolutely acceptable from the perspective of your examiner. And very importantly, whilst other people are faffing about, we have got steps that we can always use to get those numbers out nice and quick. So let's look at an example and see how we may play with that example. So we have an example, we have a summary of the steps. Uh, Warnock has 10% loan notes. Remember, 10% relates to the coupon or interest paid, and the interest is paid on the nominal or par value. Quoted at £102 x int. Redeemable in five years' time at par, par value being 100. Corporation tax is 30%. And what we want is the net of tax cost of debt. Well, okay, how do we go about it? 